Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my AM reading for Friday, May 13th, 2022, on a Saturday. <laughs> I'm feeling cautiously optimistic about my reading this week. Uh, if you've listened to some of my other videos, I've been in a state of panic, mostly about the BookTube Prize, where I'm more behind uh, with this round than I usually am, but uh, I think I've been starting to keep on top of it and uh, layer my reading. Mostly I'm listening to more audiobooks, <laughs> you know, giving myself more time to, uh, you know, add in more books uh, for the month so that hopefully I can get through my ridiculous TBR for May, both with the BookTube Prize and with other books. And I think I have a decent amount to show uh, for where I am in this sort of mid-month uh, check-in area. So let's get to it. As always with these AM reading videos since last May, I will start by uh, reading and reviewing the next story in this collection of short stories by Dorothy Parker. Uh, the one that I read for this week is called Glory in the Daytime, which was published in 1933. And it is, uh, departure might be too uh, extreme a word, because she has written some longer stories, but most of them are the dashed off variety where you get a fleeting mocking impression of the characters involved. But this one is a longer mocking impression. <laughs> well, actually, I do think its length uh, leads uh, into maybe taking the characters uh, with a little more sympathy. <laughs> uh, so anyway, this uh, story, which is about 10 pages, uh, takes place, I guess it's a contemporary story for her time, uh, it follows uh, this woman, Mrs. Murdoch uh, is her name, and she's uh, a fanciful sort of woman in a certain way. She loves plays, she has like a Peter Pan paraphernalia from back in the day that she loves, and she just has these sorts of flights of fancy about uh, actresses and, you know, the, the playhouse and that sort of thing. And uh, what do you know, she's uh, taking tea with a friend who happens to know a famous actress of the stage. Her, her name is Lily Winton, and uh, Mrs. Murdoch is just so excited, and she goes home, and she's just eagerly telling her husband about it, but Mr. Murdoch is like her polar opposite. He is a bitter man, you know, in, entrenched in the financial pages, so not at all fanciful or anything. And he spends the whole time mocking her for a phrase she drops where she says, uh, Mrs. Winton is going to drop up for tea. And he's like, drop up for tea? How do you drop up for tea? Maybe she should try dropping down for tea. But anyway, so he's no fun. <laughs> but she kind of puts him out of mind because she's just so excited about, you know, meeting an actual, you know, actress. And she just imagines, uh, it actually gets a little bit uh, petty here where she's imagining telling people about meeting the actress and all of the secrets she knows about her upcoming performances that she can't share. So I'm like, okay, chill out a little, Mrs. Murdoch. But she kind of gets her due because uh, Lily Winton is uh, not uh, the figure that uh, Mrs. Murdoch imagines. So she's uh, a bit uh, down on her luck herself. She uh, is a bit of a lush. She stays up drinking and, you know, that's all she does uh, at, at the tea. She doesn't drink tea. She drinks brandy. She makes awkward body sounds. <laughs> and uh, she is in her own fanciful little world as well about um, life and, uh, and, and her own disappointments. And like she immediately, uh, you know, puts uh, Mrs. Murdoch in a fanciful role where she first uh, imagines her as a playwright and uh, talks about, oh, you know, you must write me a play and it'll be darling, and her, you know, her um, words are completely purple prose. And then uh, when uh, they explain that Mrs. Murdoch is a wife, <laughs> uh, and also the friend even, uh, you know, talks about Mrs. Murdoch in like diminutive tone. She's like a sheltered little woman, but then, uh, Lily uh, Winton goes into, oh, it's your first marriage? Oh, that's, you know, it's precious and wonderful until he starts bringing Sluzy's home. And, and so she gets into bitterness and she also lost a lot of money to the men that she married and is very open about like uh, sexual nature stuff, or at least very open for 1933 and much more open than Mrs. Murdoch is comfortable with saying like, go, how is it going to bed with your husband? And so Mrs. Murdoch is obviously a little bit mortified by all of this. Uh, and uh, Lily Winton is not the creature she was hoping for, 
Uh, and so she uh, decides uh, upon, you know, taking a graceful, if awkward, leave of, of absence uh, that uh, she's going to, you know, be better to her husband. And, you know, she goes and she orders a bunch of food and says, I'm going to pay more attention to, you know, the meals we have together and all of that. And so she's shopping and then she goes home. And of course, Mr. Mur Murdoch is exactly the same as she left him. He's mocking her. He's still talking about the whole dropped up thing. He's still entrenched in front of his financial page. And, she, and so uh, she's disappointed and him anew as well. He's uh, apparently, uh, she, he hasn't, uh, you know, fantastically changed into someone more, more empathetic in her absence. So it's kind of a, you know, a disappointing end for Mrs. Murdoch where nobody's living up to uh, her standards here. Although she does have an interesting moment where she, you know, feels the need. She's like, I think she feels a little disappointed or distressed about Mr. Murdoch and not giving her a good time that that uh, she has to defend uh, the bad time she had with uh, the actress and it's like oh it was actually wonderful being with her and she quoted Shakespeare and I realized in retrospect that actually uh you know Lily did quote Shakespeare <laughs> It's not in the uh, I'm telling you about the play that I'm honored to be in sort of Shakespeare. It's more like uh, Lily, uh, you know, uh, envelops Shakespeare into her own sort of bitterness. So I figured I'd just read one quote about it where she says, All the world's a stage, said Lily Winton, and all the men and women merely players. They have their entrance and their exits, and every man in his time plays many parts, his act being seven ages. At first the infant mewling and puking, How's the play doing, Miss Noyes said. Oh, lousily, Lily Winton said. Lousily, lousily, lousily. But what isn't? What isn't in this terrible, terrible world? Answer me that, she reached for the decanter. <laughs> so, yeah, that's uh, the sort of Shakespeare that uh, poor Mrs. Murdoch heard. So, alas for her, but uh, I thought it was a more engaging story with uh, a little more meat on the bone. So I appreciated that aspect of it. The first book I finished this week, I talked about briefly last week. It is The Hilltop by Asaf Gavron, uh, which was translated from the Hebrew, and I read it uh, for my uh, Israel Book Club. I probably wouldn't have gotten to it otherwise, uh, but I'm glad I did. Uh, it left a more favorable impression on me than I thought it would, or I've been grappling with it, but in a, in a more positive way. I was worried I really wouldn't like it. It takes place on a fictional but illegal Israeli settlement in the West Bank, which even if it is fictional is nevertheless very based on reality. And uh, it follows a, a variety of characters therein, but predominantly it follows two brothers, uh, the Cooper brothers, and we go back into their pasts and what brought them to this place. I think in a way the, the drawback for me with this is that there's just too much action, too much plot that's kind of stuffed into this. It's a little overwhelming in that way. The main uh, plot of uh, the story of this illegal settlement is how it is sort of by a series of uh, bumbling accidents brought to national and international attention and it becomes a bit of a thorn in Israel's side so that they can no longer ignore it uh, uh, quite so much and they go through a long, tedious, comical, uh, you know, uh, process of attempting to remove the settlement, which also is near to an arid village. Um, so a lot of what Gavron is doing is uh, satirizing the reality of uh, sort of life on the ground. For, for the settlers, it's sort of a Wild West tableau. They live in uh, trailers, they have a generator, their power goes in and out, they sort of do wheeling and dealing with friends and the government to get some services that, you know, of course they're not supposed to have because they're not supposed to be there. But since they're there, the army has to be there to protect them. So they also get, you know, roads and things like that because of the army. And uh, they get, you know, other um, amenities like a nice playground from a Jewish donor from abroad. So that's kind of their Wild West reality. Um, then, uh, this story does go into a lot of backstory, as I said, for um, Gabi and Ronan Cooper about uh, the types of men they are. And I think a major question Gavron is asking is, can people change? Because they were both brought to this settlement because they wanted to change. Uh, Gabi had a storied, violent sort of past where, well, he had a temper and he... And that temper led him to some really bad altercations, the worst of them being uh, as he was taking care of his young son and uh, the realities of parenting really got the better of him and <laughs> and he was alone and there's complications with his wife as well and so he was mostly alone with his son uh, 
and he ended up losing him in a, in a custody battle and can't even uh, really have much contact or any contact with him because of how things ended with them. So he was sort of at the end of a rope and uh, turned religious. And then his uh, brother Roni comes to stay with him later. Roni is sort of, I think, supposed to be a stereotypical Sabra, and there's a commentary about his bluster and his cockiness and also his own ability to sort of, you know, play under the table and not quite play fair in uh, certain ways, uh, you know, to get ahead. Uh, and that leads to uh, him becoming a uh, very successful investment banker uh, who makes a whole lot of money on uh, the uh, sort of uh, bets he makes in the stock market until he makes one big mistake uh, and loses it all. So it's like one of those things where when, uh, you know, you can take a huge risk and it works out great for you if you could make the right call, and it works out horribly for you if you make the wrong call. So I guess that's the gamble thing. It's really the addiction of gambling, and he loses everything and has to run away. Uh, and is sort of learning, trying to uh, reestablish himself when he has nothing. So that's how they both end up there. The other characters, I think, are a varying degree of interesting. I feel like they mostly are just, they're not nearly as developed. They can be interesting in their turn. Uh, we have... Um, the story of a, of a uh, marriage that uh, I think it's, it's emotionally abusive, uh, like the, the, the man is, uh, you know, so self-centered and self-indulgent and he's uh, not helping his wife out at all and, uh, and that has its interesting up and ups and downs and there's the man who started this illegal settlement and his kids and I think the one who interested me the most was his son Yakir who made a, uh, a profile in Second Life uh, where he uh, befriended a bunch of sort of other, you know, militant uh, uh, religious Zionist Jews like himself, and they go around terrorizing, you know, Muslims and Palestinians in these digital spaces. And, you know, I was talking about it with the breakout group for my Israel club, and I'm so grateful to talk to them about these issues. But I feel like, in a way, at least in my group, they sort of downplayed uh, the reality that this isn't just, you know, a silly video game. This is, you know, a... Uh, it takes place digitally, but uh, it's, you know, it's with other people and it's not a, a prescribed script that you're following. People are making choices to terrorize other people or, you know, how they want to present themselves. And there's an irony, too, about how Second Life, or maybe I'm reaching a bit, but Second Life could be a chance for you to, you know, try something new. You could even be something fantastical, but, you know, instead these people are just sort of... Uh, exacerbating their worst flaws in cyberspace uh, until Yakir has a change of heart and kind of became my favorite character because he started to question this uh, virulence uh, and uh, the, the violence and the uh, binary thinking that he thought and was taught was so, you know, essential. He started to question all that, which easily made him the most likable character in here. I don't think there's a whole lot of likable characters, although I think Gavron does a good job of showing the granular details of their lives when people are just people, so that they're not just caricatures of evil or self-righteousness even. Uh, sometimes they can be way too self-righteous and, and, and their actions can be very unlikable, but I just feel like he really did grasp some complexity in a human uh, reality of personalities, and I think it's probably because he did lean into satire rather rather than being too overly emotional or, you know, too attached even to these characters. So I really was drawn in, I think, to his experiment and what he was trying to do, even as, as I grappled with it. I grappled with uh, the uh, religious aspects uh, that I was drawn to and then repelled by because of their, you know, the, the stringency and the binariness of the beliefs of this settlement. Uh, and, you know, what they felt entitled to do. And at the same time, I respected the beauty or the wonder of living in Judea and Samaria, which is a place where, you know, one of the subplots is about um, coins that they find in a cave. And it, and it proves, you know, Jewish uh, presence in antiquity, which is a powerful feeling, especially when so much of diaspora is about Jews not belonging to wherever they happen to live at the time. So, I mean, that's powerful, uh, but, you know, life is much more complicated than that. And then there was the whole thing where he was comparing the settlement movement to the kibbutz movement, and to a certain degree, I respect that. There's a uh, stringent ideology to both, and including, I think, in kibbutzim that still exist, uh, not quite the socialist way they used to, but still exist in Israel today, of their sort of stringent ideology of uh, who we are and what we believe and things like that. But I still think like, you know, there's a, 
it's not a mirror image because the kibbutzim, even if they started as a, they called themselves a settlement movement, to be a settlement movement in the uh, 1800s and early 1900s when Israel wasn't a state and all of the people who lived there were, you know, victims of the pogroms or the Holocaust, that's different than, you know, people who are choosing to move to, uh, to the settlements uh, in the West Bank today. Uh, they can come from disparate backgrounds, but uh, they still have the backing of a um, sovereign state with a lot of power and uh, have the option, obviously, to live somewhere that uh, is less intrusive in, to peace. Uh, so I feel like the comparisons only go so far. Uh, but maybe that's my own bias because I guess like a lot of people, I have a little bit probably too much romanticism built up about the kibbutz movement. <laughs> uh, and it, had it, it has its own downfalls that, you know, are worthy of like looking at critically, uh, even without bringing, you know, the West Bank settlements into it. But anyway, that's, I think I've gone off on a bit of a tangent now, but I really, uh, I was impressed. I feel like I, I don't know, maybe some of uh, my own sort of um, righteous assertions that I'm drawing out of this. Maybe I'm going further than Gavron would have uh, wanted to go or wanted to go himself. I don't think he wanted to be too much of an ideologue in any way. He really wanted to... Uh, sort of uh, portray people in reality in a less uh, judgmental way, I think. And from my understanding, he really nailed the bureaucracy in, in hand. Uh, and uh, I, I was uh, pleasantly surprised that uh, I was very drawn into uh, this novel. The next book I finished uh, this week was on audiobook, and it's also about politics, I would argue. It is Queen's Hope by E.K. Johnston, which is the third and final book in her Padme Amidala uh, trilogy. So this is a Star Wars novel, and in fact, I brought it up on a video I did a couple months ago of uh, SFF books I wanted to read, uh, front list books I wanted to read this year, because I mostly don't read front list uh, and uh, I was, I think, a little dismissive of it in that uh, video because, you know, it is a little derivative, isn't it? Because Disney's a corporation that, uh, you know, hired Johnston to write uh, about their franchise, basically. So it's not like, you know, as an artist coming to a work, you know, through my own imaginings, you know, <laughs> speaking as an author and a writer, obviously. But I, I, I uh, was, imp I liked it. <laughs> I actually, I read the first book and not the second book, which is weird, but actually they're a little, I think uh, they jump around a bit. I know the first book took place, I think, largely before The Phantom Menace, um, maybe a little after, but did the second book go before then? I, I can't, maybe it didn't. Maybe it is all in order. It probably is. Maybe I should read the second book. But anyway, the third book, <laughs> it takes place right after Attack of the Clones, or maybe like, you know, right in that final scene where, spoiler alert, Anakin and Padme secretly get married. That's a part of the book uh, at the very beginning. And then they go off in their separate ways. They're both highly involved in, you know, uh, huge uh, socio-political republic events. She's a senator, he is on the front lines of a war, the Clone Wars, which just started. Uh, and she is sent away to do this secret mission where she's basically looking in on the Clone War troops and seeing how the clones are treated and just seeing how the war is going with the separatists. And it also gives her a chance to do some sort of theatrical saving hostages situation, which she can't do in her normal senatorial life, which we know that Padme has that, uh, you know, streak of wanting to be more of a stereotypical badass uh, female, I think. And, and I, frankly, I think it's what led her into her secret marriage, you know, wanting that sort of, you know, badass private life for herself. Uh, but anyway, uh, while she's doing that, she calls upon one of her handmaids, Sabe, who was her decoy in The Phantom Menace, to take her place in the Senate. Uh, and Sabe is a character in these books who's sort of starting to make her own way, which I think is an interesting progression, because when we started in the first book, uh, the Naboo political structure was that Padme is sort of the big cheese, she's being groomed to be a queen, and her handmaids are very much there to serve as her shadows. And they have certain skills that she needs, and sometimes those skills are to look like her and to mimic her, but I think it, it gets a little more diversified as time goes on. But anyway, Sabe's job certainly is to be able to act like her and look like her even in the Senate, but she's starting to change. She has her own sort of mission where she's trying to sl free slaves on Tatooine and be her own person, and she's noting this distance between her and Padme. So 
So this book that's kind of, you know, supposed to be about Padme having a secret and personal relationship with Anakin, although that's not really much, not a huge part of the book, but really it's about her relationship with someone else who was a deep part of her life ending because they're going on two different paths. So I found that really interesting. And there's other subplots as well. Maybe like the past book, there's too much, you know, that's jam-packed into too little space. Like, I feel like there's a lot of really interesting uh, political subplots in this YA uh, Star Wars novel where we follow Padme and her handmaidens around and get into a little bit more complexity about uh, how uh, these uh, issues work during a wartime where it betresses against... Uh, uh, colonization narratives and uh, treaties and, and all sorts of things. Uh, and I wish that, uh, you know, in a longer novel, maybe uh, we could have, you know, aired things out a bit, uh, including characters, uh, characters and uh, plot. Uh, but for what was there, I thought it was very compelling. And of course, I, I listened to the audiobooks, and I love the audiobooks because, you know, it's Disney, so they have all the rights to the music uh, that, uh, and then they also do a lot of sound effects and that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, actually, it's a funny time because uh, I just saw the trailers uh, for the soon to be released Obi-Wan Kenobi miniseries on Disney Plus, which uh, is a bit nostalgic uh, for me as a prequels fan. And I think we live in the age in the post sequel Star Wars world where it's kind of okay to be a prequels fan again. And I guess Disney threw enough money at, uh, you know, Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christensen that they'd reprise the roles of Anakin and Obi-Wan, or, you know, Obi-Wan and Anakin, uh, to be cynical about it. But uh, I don't know, it's still, I, I don't even have Disney Plus. I'm not actually going to watch it, I don't think. But uh, it's, um, I don't know, it's uh, it's kind of nice to think that maybe people are more okay with the, the prequels and the stories they told, or maybe I'm just relating them because the prequels actors are reprising their roles for this uh, post-prequel story. And what I'm trying to say through all of this is I would, you know, the thing that would break me, and I'd really, really want to get Disney Plus, is if they actually did an adaptation of these Padme Amidala books. Although, at the same time, maybe I should remind myself that listening to them on audio is kind of like you know, watching or at least listening to an adaptation where you get to hear all the sound effects and the musical sort of emotionality that you wouldn't get to hear, unless I guess you have that active sort of imagination while you're reading it. Uh, so yeah, I guess I'm feeling kind of uh, optimistic or happy about the Star Wars universe, or at least I've found a niche that I enjoy. I also uh, feel very old because I remember when the prequels were so shiny and new, it's like, oh, we're reviving the original Star Wars from like, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And now, of course, the prequels are almost that old anyway. So, <laughs> uh. but that's really, I guess, to, to bring it on home now, what I really like about uh, these sorts of novels, what I really like about E.K. Johnston's uh, Podmate, the two ones that I read her novels, is that it really does flesh out that character who I do think sometimes was badly served by the prequels, uh, sometimes well served, but sometimes badly served. Uh, and uh, gives a little more dimension to what was going on with her. The next book that I just started reading, or I think I'm a little under 150 pages into, is The Slaughterman's Daughter. It's another book translated from the Hebrew. It's by Yaniv Itzkovitz, uh, which was the fiction pick for my Maybe Midrash readathon that I'm in the middle of now, or I guess I've just started now. Uh, and I will link to my TBR video for that down below. Uh, this book, um, takes place uh, in 1884 in the Pale of Settlement in the Russian Empire, like largely between, uh, I think largely in Poland, and uh, the main character is uh, trying to make her way to Minsk, which is a Jewish woman. It's pretty unheard of to be on the road, but she has a reason to be so. She is trying to track down a wayward brother-in-law who's basically left her sister and children in, in misery, in abject poverty and misery. Uh, so... That is her goal. She is um, accompanied by a man called Zizek, who is an interesting figure, I suppose. He, like many uh, young Jewish boys, was forcibly taken from his home to serve in the Tsar's army. Most young boys who are forcibly taken basically lose, you know, contact with their Jewishness and with their families. You know, they're, you know, forced basically to Christianize themselves. Um, and uh, Zizek is someone who attempts to come home afterwards, but uh, the Jewish community itself is very 
uh, insular and a little paranoid, I think, and uh, they've had a lot of hardships. Like his brother uh, was able to escape uh, service and uh, was ultimately killed for it, and his uncle was killed. And so there's just a lot of hardships. So he's not a very, he's not seen as part of the community anymore, and he lives on the outskirts and he decides to help Franny, who is the main character here, and the slaughterman's daughter. Uh, and there's a lot of, I think, uh, there, I see some criticism of the book because there is a lot of, uh, there can, it's a, it's a violent uh, book, or at least a little, I'd say at least it's semi-violent. Uh, it, it depicts uh, some violence, <laughs> so, it, especially against or including against animals because uh, Franny is the daughter of a, uh, a kosher butcher. Uh, so we see a little bit of uh, the butchery that goes on. Uh, so there's that. I feel like you have to uh, know going into this book that there will be some depiction of uh, violence and death of animals and of people, <laughs> as it turns out. Uh, I think this uh, book is kind of compared to Quentin Tarantino and kind of compared to the Coen brothers because there's, I think, a little bit of... Uh, it's not quite satire like the other book, I, I don't think, uh, but it's... Uh, almost like a, a fable in a way. It's, you know, I talked about how in how I thought maybe it would strip away some of the nostalgia of the shtetl, and now I'm thinking I probably was incorrect. Uh, Franny, first of all, is a character who doesn't act like most Jewish women, <laughs> not at all. Most Jewish women aren't trained to be uh, kosher slaughterers, and most would never get that far if they tried to leave. Uh, I don't think most would leave uh, because of uh, the parameters of the society that uh, they're in. But well, now I'm going off the rails. Uh, but anyway, uh, so far I think it's a really engaging reading. I guess it reminds me of uh, how engaging literature can be. I, I talk about not liking plot that much, but frankly, sometimes plot <laughs> makes things happen. I guess that's the point of plot, and uh, that can be very compelling, and it makes this this world come alive. And I do think that maybe is something that the big difference maybe is that uh, because she leaves her shtetl and her Jewish homeland, she gets to see a broader reality of uh, the Russian Empire and uh, where Jews fit into it, which is not a great place. <laughs> she could probably know that as is because of the violence, but, uh, uh, you know, the anti-Semitic uh, violence, but uh, now she's sort of in a very different role. And in fact, one of the characters is a uh, secret policeman uh, because Franny, uh, as she travels, she has skills that uh, probably most women and most uh, even traveling Jews don't have where she is able to defend herself from attack, and that's how she ends up killing three people. And this uh, clever secret policeman is on her case, and he's clever in sort of uh, figuring out what happened, but I feel like his uh, mindset is in, you know, whoever would kill someone is doing it to take down the Russian Empire. So what game is she playing? And of course, that's not what she's actually doing. She was just trying to defend herself. So that's an interesting little subplot as well. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's roughly where I am with this right now. And uh, I will be reporting back. And the final thing I have to talk about, I can only talk about one book two prize book in these videos and only to bring it up briefly. So I'm going to start reading soon. Uh, Facing the Mountain, a true story of Japanese-American heroes in World War II by Daniel James Brown. I always get confused by this part at top. Uh, like, is this part of the title? No, this is the title. Like, I don't know. I, I don't really like how this layout of the cover. Not that I will be uh, judging <laughs> based on the cover of the book. Uh, this is a historical, uh, not novel, <laughs> account of uh, World War II from the perspective of uh, some Japanese-American soldiers. Uh, and uh, that's what I know about it, and that's about all I can tell you, because I'm officially judging it for the BookTube Prize. I'm a judge for the quarterfinals in nonfiction group A. I am judging this against five other titles of nonfiction. Um, and my ballot <laughs> is due at the end of the month, I'm very aware of, because I still uh, have a bunch of these, uh, a few of these books to get through, just a few <laughs> of these books to get through before the end of the month. Uh, so, if you would like more information about the BookTube Prize, uh, which was started a couple years ago by Robert and Barter Hordes, and wherein we judge the best in U.S. published uh, literary fiction, nonfiction, and translated fiction, anyway, I <laughs> have a link to the BookTube Prize down below, and I have a link to my preliminary thoughts on my ballot for this uh, round down below, so check that out. And with that amount of ramble out of the way, where I seem to be saying a million things in one sentence, that about covers it for me now. <laughs> I'm hoping to get a good amount of reading in. As I've been talking about, I have a lot still to get through as uh, we're 
getting to the second half of the month here. Uh, I have a couple of other plans uh, this weekend, but hopefully I can uh, move around them easily enough. We shall see. I will, of course, be reporting back in my uh, next day I'm reading video next week. But before then, I hope to be back in the next couple of days to do the Would You Read It Challenge, which is a uh, book tag that I've co-opted for my own ends. I have been uh, revisiting some of the old books I uh, read in years past, and uh, this month I want to look at some of my uh, 2016 reading, and I will be sharing the first few paragraphs with you, and uh, we'll discuss uh, their merits, or lack thereof. <laughs> So stay tuned for that. It's nice to be doing a video where I've already completed all of the reading therein, and it isn't a stressor that's for the future. <laughs> I hope you all are not too stressed out about your reading and that you are enjoying what you're doing and feeling accomplished in it. And I hope you also have uh, great other things planned this weekend as well. Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>